I, I don't think so. I, I think uh, I'm ready to roll if you guys are. Uh, All right. Kim, if you, Kim, if you don't mind, if I can just jump in quickly. Uh, mm -hmm. You'll need to record the meeting as your uh, I've switched yep. the host controls to you. You got it? We got it. We're we're rolling. We're recording. Okay. okay. Good. All right. We'll turn it over to you, Sarah. Take it away. Okay. All right. Let me just share my stuff here. Oh, that's not what we want to see. Okay. Let me move us. Okay. You guys, thanks so much for being here today. Um, this is a big undertaking. Thank you so much to Love Gymnastics uh, for having me here today. And um, thanks so much for everyone else for taking the time out of your day and uh, out of this crazy time to think about how we can move forward with preschool gymnastics. Um, and just for terminology sake, I, I know different places have different terminologies for things. So um, I know often kinder gym is used, so I'm not quite sure if in the UK, if, if it's kinder gym or not, but I just want to be super clear when I say preschool, I'm talking zero to kindergarten um, age kiddos. So I wanted to start with that just so we're all on the same page. Um, I'm Sarah Fennel Cooper from Happy Gymnastics and um, super happy to be here today. So I wanted to start today with sort of a disclaimer because we're talking about <laughs> how to bring preschool uh, gymnastics back from um, being in a pandemic. <laughs> so to say it's unprecedented is an understatement and we all know this, right? So I wanted to say um, today, I don't have all the answers for you, but my outcome, I'm, what I'm hoping the outcome is, is to get your wheels turning, to think about things in a different way and maybe um, give you some ideas of how this can happen in your gym. So I don't have all the answers, but the great thing is we have options. There's always options. And this is um, definitely one of those times where it seems like overwhelming, but I promise you there's lots of options of how we can bring preschool back and it's going to be okay. It's going to be awesome. Parents and kids are so excited yeah, to get back yeah, in yeah. the gym um, and everything's going to be all right. So today we're going to do, we're going to talk about a strategy, a specific strategy that I think holds the most promise for us. And then um, uh, we're going to do a few ideas. Um, a, a reminder if you wouldn't mind just muting that thing. If that's all right. I will get finish up. Okay, I'm just looking for the mute all button. And as soon as I find it, <laughs> promise I will use it. Yeah, just go ahead and make sure that everyone's muting themselves. That's much better. Thanks, guys. There we go. Okay. So, but it's not a one-size-fits-all solution. So you're going to have to do um, sort of an audit and inventory of what your space looks like, what your um, staff is feeling like, and what, what kind of leadership you want to show up as um, to bring preschool back into your space and start it again. So I don't think at this point there's one-size-fits-all. Um, but that's a great thing too, right? There's, there's always a ton of options. So let's do this. Let's talk about um, what preschool is gonna look like. So, whoa, sorry, there we go. So phase one, and this is a big phase and it seems really silly, but you have to mourn what was. Um, like we, there we go. <laughs> there we go, now I'm unmuted. Okay. Uh, so we have to mourn what was, right? Um, and it's really hard because, I mean, I'm a business owner. You are all business owners. When it's your business, it's very personal. And you put your blood, sweat, and tears into your business and your preschool program. So it's hard to kind of put that aside and sort of lay that to rest. So today, the first phase we're going to talk about is being in gratitude for how your preschool program served you but it's no longer serving you in that way, right? Um, so we have to kind of mourn it. And we have to mourn it to make room, we have to lay that preschool program to rest to make room for what our new preschool program is gonna look like. So we're gonna be in gratitude for it, right? Thank you for how it served you, but it's not serving you anymore. We have to create something new. Because the temptation is going to be 
um, to look at what you had and try and shove it in this new box of social distancing and COVID-19 and cleaning all the time and all those things. And the reality is we're going to have to rethink everything. So instead of trying to recreate what you had, we're going to rethink how we can make this work in um, the new way of doing things. And all we're doing is thinking about how you're going to serve your clients in a new way. That's, that's all. We're just going to create bah, 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 the new system, right? Um, and we're going to do like baby steps for that. Don't let that feel overwhelming to you. We're going to take the ideas that you used to use and the ideas that you had, and we're just going to create a new system and a new way of serving your preschool families. So new system positives. <laughs> Let's start with the positives, right? So this is sort of I wanted to come at this as like a whole, like an industry whole, roughly here we are. Um, here are the positives. As compared to like nursery school or daycare, kids are with us for a really short time, right? Fit, usually 45 to 50 minutes. So that's a positive. Ratios, our ratios are naturally under the current recommendations. So um, they're roughly 10-ish groups of 10 right now. This is the end of May, 2020, if you're watching this at a different time. But our ratios are, are naturally under what the recommendations are. So that's a positive. Just this week, and again, so fluid, we gotta be super flexible. Um, the CDC findings are that the surfaces are not as, um, they don't transmit as much as they originally thought. So again, super flexible, that may change, but right now that's positive for us. Um, and then the Aspen Institute, um, one of their recommendations is limiting, oh, I'm gonna try and move this, sorry. Woo. Okay, just kidding. Oh, there we go. Limit um, your equipment to small groups at a time and poof, we already have small groups, right? So that's great. So if you think about other sports, they are more challenged than we are. Um, cause we have a bunch of positives in our corner. Okay. Challenges. <laughs> so that's what we're going to spend the rest of the time talking about our challenges for bringing preschool back. Challenge number one, a number one, <clears throat> excuse me. There's no model for this. No one's been here before. No one's done it. No one's tried it. This is both a positive and a negative. We get to rethink everything again, both a positive and a negative. Maybe this is stuff you haven't thought about in a long time and it's great. It's going to be a refresh. Um, two, you are not for everyone right now. Um, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit later. Um, and then three, this is a biggie. How do you socially distance in preschool classes, right? That is our biggest challenge as we come, uh, come back. Oh, there we go. All right. So you are not for everybody right now. And the great thing about this, oh my gosh, why isn't this moving? There we go. There we go. The great thing about this is that you never were. And no one's business is for everyone. Mine isn't, Kim's isn't, everybody's business is not for everybody in the whole world. You serve um, a specific group of parents. And this is true now more than ever because there's a spectrum of parents right now. The parents who think your measures are going to be over the top, right? Like, why are you cleaning all the time? Why do my kids have to do X, Y, Z when they wash their hands or whatever? And all the way to parents who think your measures are not enough. And the thing I think we need to think about is that we're serving right now. Like, as you phase this back in, the parents who you're going to serve are going to skew to the left of this continuum of Parents who are ready, they're like, oh yeah, sure, what, I'll do whatever, but I want them to come to gymnastics. So they're a little more liberal about how they're moving around the world right now. But the other thing to remember is that the parents on the right, you are not going to do enough for them right now. It doesn't exist for them, and that's A-okay. They will come back. They'll be back, I promise, but just not right now. Um, so another thing to think about is keeping your online offerings even when you open your doors. I don't think they will compete against each other. They're another way for you to serve your preschool audience. The people who will want to be in the gym will come. The people who aren't ready won't, and that's a-okay. Oh, there we go. Okay. 
So let's talk about that. It's no surprise that young children aren't built to socially distance. <laughs> and I hope you can giggle about that as much as I can. Because, right, if you've been around, all of you have taught or uh, been around young children, of course, they're not built to socially distance. Little kids are amazing and delightful and also gross, right? <laughs> they like snot on each other and be close to each other and touch each other's everything, right? So they don't have, they like, like don't have the developmental capability, the spatial awareness or social emotional awareness to gauge whether they're six feet or two meters from another person. They, they just don't have it. So our, the new system that you have to rethink and create has to support um, them being socially distanced from each other because they're not. They're not built to do it on their own. But they're also, if you think about it, they're not coming out, you know, coming right into class and doing a cartwheel, right? They have to learn that. Your system is built to support them learning a cartwheel. Now we just have to rethink our system to support them socially distancing from each other as best they can and as best we can. So the way I think, like logistically, um, the best approach to this is what I'm what I'm calling the stick and switch. I used to call it like the stay and rotate, but it sounded really boring. And so yesterday I was like, well, how can we make this like zhuzhed up a little bit? Oh, let's call it like stick and switch. Okay. So this is how I like to teach. And this is how I recommend to teach preschool is in a circuit style as best you can. So all the equipment's in a circle in, in usually in, in regular times, or my kids have taken to calling <laughs> the time uh, before COVID the before, which I think is a perfect way to sum it up. In the before, uh, kids used to just rotate around in a flow that they um, determined, right? They would do one station, they do the panel mat station with the snake, and then move to the next one and the next one and the next one. And uh, what has to change is we need more control right? We need more control of their distance to each other. So I think the stick and switch approach does this. And what that means is you can set up the circuit, um, keeping in mind the distance of clumps of equipment or stations from each other. They stay on that station. So they stick on that station. And then the coach has like a switch song. So the coach has a switch song, switch song. I don't know, whatever it is, she can make it up. Um, and that's when they switch to the next bit of equipment. So then you're able to shift and control their distance from each other a little bit more. So this is what I'm sort of approaching as um, the most likely scenario where it gives us the most control of having kids far from each other. Now, um, again, like no one's been in the gym, right? Including me. I've done this in the past with kindergartners for sure. No problem. Um, fours, like four fives, no problem. Three Bs, this is going to take a while. This is going to be tricky. Um, but I think you can do it. You're going to have to have incredible visuals to support this. So um, I talked to a gym owner last week that is going to do boxes um, around like different colored tape boxes, like the, the panel mat station with the snake will be in the blue box. And then the green trapezoid with the shark on it, that'll be in the um, pink box. And then the next one will like have a different color box for each um, set of like each station. The other thing to think about is that um, usually if you take away these circles that are like quasi distracting and I apologize for that. I didn't know they would keep going. Um, when in the before, when they used to flow through, we used to have stations that are like, see those hearts and that circle right there on the right that are sort of pass through stations that are like a, um, a line to get them from one place to the other. We can't really have those anymore because that's not engaging enough to do over and over and over again for a minute and a half for two minutes. So sort of rethinking how we're structuring things to support these um, guys and your coaches. Okay. So other things to think about. Oh, yeah. I never, I always, I've done like a million Zoom things and I always forget that this, um, it's in the way. Sorry. 
Okay, so stick and switch. More things to think about. Gives you the most control, I think, um, of social distancing. You're gonna have to have amazing visuals. Also, when I, <laughs> over the weekend, I was in the gym shooting new lesson plans for Happy Gymnastics that are designed to be used post um, COVID preschool. And here's what I um, came across the most, or I thought about the most. No spotting um, is going to be a challenge. So I designed all the lesson plans to have no spotting for the coaches because of that distance piece. So I focus more on combinations. So skills that are easily verbally taught and then easily stacked, like stacked, like if you're doing forward roll, you can do forward roll straddle jump or straddle jump forward roll or something they can add on to keep it challenging, but also um, keep in mind that they're not going to be able to manipulate kiddos body shapes. So um, when you're thinking about your lesson plans, think about how you can structure them to support your coaches and not being able to spot. And also when you're introducing this new system, it's going to take kids a while. So I think that's okay for a minute. And we're going to come back to this um, idea in a minute. So it gives you most control of distance. I think right now, this is my best, um, best, educated guess of how um, we can best do this. And then beef up your station. So this is a question I thought about if they're staying on that particular station for a long time, do we need to beef up what we do there? Probably. But then that brings into um, play how much can they remember, but also the coaches and spotting. So she'll be there to remind them. So play with that, play with how much they can handle in one um, station or one um, box. And then um, I thought about skills far, like, <laughs> this is weird. They're face far from the mat. So at one point I, did, I shot a lesson plan called Art Week and I was like, oh, we're going to do pencil rolls. And then I was like laid on the mat and thought, no, I can't because their sweet little faces sometimes get smushed down onto the mat. And that's like, we're not doing that right now. Right. I think forward roll, strata roll is fine. Um, pencil or like or log rolls however the terminology you want to use um their faces can't be like <laughs> smushed into the mat if that sounds really um it sounds kind of weird but that happens sometimes right so thinking about that aspect as well and then also as we talked about this new routine will take a ton of time um for them to learn but that's a-okay so phase three, what does social distance look like in preschool classes, right? So we talked about this stick and switch approach. Um, it's not the only one, um, but I think it's the one that holds the most promise for the most people. And then, so in this section, I wanted to do some guiding questions because this is not going to be a one size fits all solution for everyone. Um, I wanted to, to sort of um, frame up some questions for you to think about what this new preschool can look like in your space. So rituals, this has come up a lot. What um, people have been talking about stamps and coloring sheets and stickers and things. So I think it's healthy to think about the rituals overall for your program. And what new rituals can you create to still keep that connection with your kids um, <clears throat> and keep your coaches safe and your um, gymnast safe? So I'm recommending no stamps for now until we know more about how things are spread. And that's like a super close interaction, right? Um, and of course it's preschool. So we're like filled with high fives. What else can you do other than a high five to celebrate a great job, to connect with kids? So we're gonna have to rethink what the rituals are for your class. These are the sacred bits of class that um, make you have to be present with your kids. Um, and they are, they can be individual to your program. They're another way to stand out, right? If you have, um, sacred rituals in your classes, um, they're, they're going to be custom to what you are doing. So here are some ideas like a dance. Is there like, instead of a five, you all do like the same dance move or, um, air high fives, right? Or air foot fives there. Um, there's this thing called a firework clap that goes like, with like twinkle fingers down. So there are a ton, I think there's brilliant on here. Oh, there's like brilliant. Um, so there's 
there's lots of options here. But again, it's just like taking that rethinking piece and this is the way we've always done it, which is so easy to fall into, especially if your business is established for many years and just rethinking how you're serving your clients. So thinking about rituals and connection without a high five. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay, so routine. <clears throat> Woo, sorry. So we talked about the stick and switch. So this is um, all about what is the routine of class gonna be? So we talk about that stick and switch approach. The other approaches that I have seen, um, and again, it's just works what's best, what's best to, to work for your space and your um, organization. I've seen the approach of parents helping with everything. People are gonna try that with all age groups. Um, and then waiting spots. So this is, so I have my whiteboard here. I don't know if you can see this. Yes, good, okay. So waiting spots would be kids would still, so this is your circuit and there's like a wedge mat here, a bar, whatever the pieces of equipment are, boop, boop, boop. <clears throat> so kids flow through, but there are waiting spots. So they would go, they would do this station and then they'd go on their waiting spot. And this would be significant distance apart. And then they would go to the next station like each station has a waiting bit to keep them away from their friends. That's something I've seen. <clears throat> um, another thing that I've seen, and I got this ready, just last night, somebody posted on, somebody shared um, on the Happy Gym uh, Facebook page that she was gonna do like a train, like a train station, and they each got like a ticket, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then her equipment is gonna be in the circuit, it's gonna be numbered, and the kids would go, like if they got number four, they would start at station four and make their way around. Whoa, there we go. <laughs> um, the, the only issue I see with that is that um, they're preschoolers, so they don't know necessarily um, numbers in print yet. So the, the way you could get around that is using color or animals or shapes. So keeping in mind when you are rethinking your preschool system, what developmentally can kids handle, right? Um, also to think about routine, what is the new behavior routine gonna look like? So this is where we really need to come in hot for our coaches because um, kids are gonna, kids have been through a lot. Um, they're going to be emotionally up and down. And now they have their, their parents have been busy. Everybody's been working from home. It's been this really time of upheaval in their lives. And yes, there's going to be a little even out by the time they get to you, but also they're coming into this space, perhaps expecting the same experience that they had before. And it's not right. So it's just another shift and change and change is really tricky for preschoolers. So <clears throat> To combat this, make sure you're giving a heads up for what your new preschool system looks like to your parents so they can show their kiddos. And two, we're gonna talk about this in a little bit, your language is gonna become important here about how you're framing this up. Um, so kids are gonna be emotionally all over the place. It's gonna be very similar to the beginning of the school year where it takes them that six, eight weeks to sort of drop in and get the normal class experience. Um, and I think even kids who you think usually are sort of pretty even keeled, they're going to be up and down too. So behaviors are going to be, um, spiking. So, so when you're thinking of routine, consider having a behavior routine. So like, what's a coach supposed to do, um, if their kiddo sprints across the gym, right? We've all had a runner. It's terrifying. Um, what do they do? right? In, in social distance time. So creating that behavior routine in advance so coaches can have that in their back pocket and to be able to bust it out when they need it. Um, so language, right? We just talked about this a little bit. Language is going to become really important. I was seeing a couple of posts of concern <clears throat> um, about um, 
what is preschool going to look like? Are we going to be cleaning all the time? That's, that's not how we want to um, show kids. Like it's going to scare kids with face masks. It's going to scare kids to um, be cleaning all the time. Are they going to think they're going to think their friends are dirty and they're going to be confused. So all of these things are coming up. And the reality is this is the new way we're, we're going to have to do things. So it's all in the way that you frame it. So if you come at it like, yeah, put on your face mask, right? It's all in the way you present it. Of course, the kids are going to be like, I guess I got to put on my face mask or she's going to be wearing a face mask the whole time. The studies and the, the very little research that I was able to find um, from an organization called Zero to Three they're um, advocates for, uh, for early childhood and infants. They found um, that, so childcare have already been back, right? And they, their, their staff was wearing masks and they said it's shockingly not been a factor for their students. So it's all in how you present what this is. So instead of saying like, we're going to change everything now. Everything's totally different, guys. We're going to say some like, we got this new way of doing things. It's really exciting. You want to honor what it is, right? Sometimes this can feel a little weird and a little scary coming back to gymnastics, but this is going to be really great because it's a new way to do things. And I know you guys are ready. So having that sing-songy switch song, um, you can call your little... Um, stick and switch, like stay on your island, stay on your cloud, stay on your bubble. Um, a woman in our membership um, group called is calling the hand sanitizer like magic wash. So they got to magic wash their hands. Like that's more engaging than like we got to sanitize our hands, right? So think about that language piece of things when you are rethinking what this is going to look like in your space. Okay. And then the big three gym rules. So I like to teach, there are three, um, the big three gym rules. And these are like parent taught through however many teen kids you have. You can use them gym wide um, <clears throat> because everything that we do in the gym fits under one of these big three rules. And instead of having a laundry list of like, we don't run away from our coach and we keep the chalk in the chalk bucket and we like do all these things, you can file it under one of these three things. Three things are super digestible for preschoolers. And um, if you keep them consistent all the way through your programming, then it's not going to be, you're gonna, not going to have to reteach this in your rec or your uh, team program. So number one is I can follow my coach's directions. Two, I can stay with my coach in the gym. Three, I can keep myself and my crew safe. So these were true before and they're true now. Right? They're just going to look a little bit different. So I can follow my coach's directions. That means just staying on your bubble and then switching when you hear the switch song. Or I can stay with my coach in the gym. Means we're close, but not together and touching. I can keep myself and my crew safe. One of the ways to do that is to make sure my hands are clean and I keep myself to myself. So <clears throat> taking these three, um, the big three gym rules and modifying them of what they mean um, is a great way to like add some consistency to the program. Okay, so let's talk about coach relationships with parents. I'm a huge proponent of um, PTT or parent talk time after class. Parent talk time is important because it's the bridge between what happens in the gym and what parents know, right? If that bridge is broken, if that time isn't happening, parents have no idea what's happening in the gym. <clears throat> so after class, it's super important for the coach to communicate what they taught, what the theme was, what the intention was, and then connect with each gymnast um, as she uh, gets connected with her parent. So what is this going to look like? Um, I've talked to people there, drop off and pick up is perhaps going to look a lot different. A lot of people are doing drive-by drop off and pick up. So what could parent talk time look like? This can be done. Um, I talked to a woman um, last week who was doing drive-by pickup. So her office staff was going to help her, but everything was outside. Like parents uh, were not coming in the gym. She got closed circuit um, television so they could watch on their phone. 
but she was not going to allow them in the gym for pickup or drop off. So we talked about having a whiteboard that maybe she could write her parent talk time or if parents were sort of congregated, but not close to each other, they're in the same area, but not close socially distance. They're going to have to use those big yelling coach voices and communicate what their magic intention um, was for this lesson. <clears throat> and the reason I wanted to, to bring this up is because gosh, I'm so sorry, guys, <clears throat> is because connection and relationships with parents are going to become so important. They were important before, in the before, uh, but they are so much more important now. That communication piece and that connection piece with parents is going to be huge. So you have to find a way to structure um, your parent talk time after class, even with um, the social distance. Oh, another suggestion here is having um, signs on the wall if your lobby is big enough and having like the four or five class parents meet here, everything's socially distanced. So at least the coaches have an area that they're going to go to um, uh, to make their class announcements. Okay, so when you're thinking about actual class and your lesson planning for class, it's huge to not forget we have to set your intention. Um, even though you have all these um, challenges and all these constraints of what can and cannot be right now, I think the thing to remember is you can't forget the intention of forward progress of skills. We, we can't um, let the challenges dictate that we're no longer teaching like valuable gymnastic skills. It still has to be focused on how can these kids make progress. And the intention for the first six weeks of um, your new preschool system can be the kids learning the system. That's A-OK. -okay. Um, and then after that, we got to keep beefing things up. How will you make sure your preschool gymnasts are still making forward progress in their skills? We still need to make sure the intention is really set up. So when you are thinking about this, this is what came up for me when I was shooting on the weekend for the stick and switch. And as I was planning with this intention of how are they still going to make forward progress on their skills? <clears throat> um, so I want to point out that, so this is, I'm just like spilling the tea on all these theme weeks. This is Mac and cheese week. And I put a circle around it as a way, as a visual like example of this is one bubble that you can stay in, stick on, and then switch to the next one. Um, so skills friendly to verbal teaching. Remember we have to set our coaches up to win. They're going to need more support on that. And then two visuals for where to stand and stay. So again, this is way more important even than it was before. This is best practice anyway, but this is critical now. You have to have concrete visuals for where to stand and stay. And then the other thing I thought about was um, for my coaching career uh, and curriculum planning, I always set up the circuit so there's a flow. There's like a strategic flow. One thing, like this bar, she's going to swing and then it leads into that next station of uh, the rainbow station. So what I did on the uh, lesson plans that I shot for post-COVID was strategically place equipment so there's no flow. So she maybe would have been going the other way. Um, and, and, it, and it doesn't naturally lead them to the next place. Um, so, so they kind of get the picture of, oh, I forgot I'm supposed to stay on my station. Right, I forgot about that. I'm supposed to stick here for a little bit. Like it doesn't naturally let them know where to go next if that makes sense. Okay, plan for the magic. So this is a biggie because this is what makes preschool preschool, right? The magic bit of it. Um, we start with our skills, your focus skills, and then sprinkle that magic on top, which makes um, preschool so amazing. So thinking about how will we keep things magical and engaging with this new stick and switch strategy or whatever new strategy you're going to implement, and I found myself having many temper tantrums about not being able to use props <laughs> as much as I normally want because there are such amazing visual cues um, and enhance the learning and the experience for your preschool gymnast so much. 
Um, but the bottom line is we were limited, right? We, we can't use as many props right now as we normally have. And when I say props, I mean like little, for lack of a better term, toys or um, I like to call them like learning enhancement, learning um, supports for preschool. Um, so we can't use plush props. I would not, and anything that you cannot wipe down and or wash every single night, don't use it. Just like table it for now. Um, and because we're taking away that support, your stories are going to become more important because we don't have, there's a lack of visual support on what to do. Cause when you have say like a balance beam with nothing on it, but then you have a balance beam with, um, bears all the way across, they're going to remember, they remember, Oh, I'm like tiptoeing across the sleeping bears, but because we can't use our bears right now, the stories that you create around your stations are going to become so much more important. So if you have a beam with nothing on it, which I wouldn't recommend, but might be the reality, you have to create some sort of story of how they're moving their body. Maybe this is like the penguin beam and it's really cold. So we're moving like a penguin across it. So those quick little stories that are going to trigger, oh yeah, this is the penguin beam. So we don't have those visuals. So we have to create a story around it. And stories are quick. They got to be fast. They're not like lengthy tales. They're just like quick little stories. Okay. Also, I found colors are going to be more important. So I think you should still use some props very strategically, very um, sanitizable, if that's a word, um, props, and then color becomes so much more important. So um, for Mac and Cheese Week, it was all orange, right? And we all have the poly circles that are super easy to wipe off. So I used those. Um, having the color as an enhancement, um, as a learning tool, was, is going to be really helpful. Also, skills that make kids, again, this is got to rethink everything. Skills that make kids go over the props and not handle them with their hands often. So um, when I did use a prop, it was, how can we go over this or use it in a way where um, I even use them as decoration rather than a prop that they would um, use and consume for learning. So I used a lot of like tinsel um, on this edge of bars. So they're not touching it, but it's there to create that magical experience for your preschoolers. Because we still need to create that even though we have all these constraints. Um, I also experimented for having props for one gymnast for the whole rotation. And I'm so sorry I don't have a prop, a, a, um, an image of this, so I'll just describe it. So I had, it was a beam rotation and I had, um, so you know, you get the pack of hoops and there's six different colors. So each child would choose a color and that was their hoop through the entire rotation. And they used that hoop on almost every station. So they are the only ones touching that hoop. And then at the end you wipe them down, obviously. Um, so that's another way to approach it. My worry with that immediately is I don't know how scalable and sustainable that is, like lesson planning wise. Um, but it's something to try. It's something to try depending on that, that parent continuum. Oh, you're not, you're doing too much and oh, you're not doing enough. Maybe having one prop um, would solve some of the, the fear and anxiety some parents might have. We, we don't know. It's something to think about. And then I also thought, okay, so we are decreasing this sense, the visual sense. So let's increase another sense, which is sound. So I hid bells in a lot of places. Like, um, I, I mean, we all put them on rings, but I put them on rings. So they're not touching them. Put them on rings. I put them on the side of an, an eight-incher or a mat. So when they walked on it or they jumped on it, it would like ding, 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 ding. Um, and I made it part of the lesson plan. So think about how using sound, even sounds from their own mouth of like, if they're jumping across a beam, they're maybe making a bunny sound or on Mac and Cheese Week, they, it's all about like straddle and snap together. Excuse me. One of the stations was just standing in a straddle and saying, macaroni, 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 and then snapping together for cheese. 
So using that sound, because we've eliminated another sense, um, using sound might be an option to increase the engagement and that creating that magical experience for your preschoolers. So creating your crew. This is creating a little mini community within your preschool classes. Your coaches are going to need ton of support here. Um, so how will your coaches connect with gymnasts? This is a big question. So this is done mostly in warm up and in closing circle. So that begs the question, what is warm up gonna look like? Um, uh, I think warm up is going to be the easiest bit, arguably, because I think you can really rely heavily on music and um, just um, having more distance between your opening circle. So instead of the kids sitting right next to each other, they're sitting farther apart, right? I think it's, it's to me, the most like uh, doable, immediate uh, way to socially distance. But it begs the question, how are your coaches going to connect with their gymnasts? If you can't physically connect in a high five, how are they going to talk to them? Is the, um, what opportunities are you going to create in your lesson plan? Um, because we've taken away that, that spotting station where they're physically close to each other, the coach is <laughs> teaching and manipulating their body shapes, that's a big connection piece. How else can, where can the conversation happen, right? Between kids and coaches. Um, I still think it can happen in warm up and closing circle. It's just the way it's gonna look is a little bit different. Also, when you're thinking about closing circle, I like to do a song that includes everybody's name, individual connection, and a whole group connection where you say the name of the class. Um, to sort of solidify that this is their crew, this is their community where they belong. Um, so what is that going to look like? There's a ton of options here, like creativity out the wazoo. I have to say, I don't think I'm alone in this. The coaches have stepped up during this pandemic. They are not afraid of technology. They all jumped in and were like, yeah, I can do an online class. No big deal. Yeah, let me run, run the Instagram for a while. They have been amazing. So look at your coaches that have stepped up, shown up, showed you their creativity and ask them how to solve these problems. Get their input. What do they want closing circle to look like? Because their brain is not going to be as taxed as business owner brain, program director brain right? Because we're solving all these problems at like such a high level. The coaches are like freedom for creativity because they're all they're thinking about is class. So tap into your coaches as a resource here. All right. So speaking of coaches, kid focused teaching is the next bit. How will you support your coaches in the new style of teaching? And what I mean by that is this pitfall. This is like, mark, mark, mark. So one of the things we, we talk a lot about in um, uh, the membership group is teaching versus supervising. And this is a tricky bit for a lot of program directors and gym owners. How do you get coaches to teach rather than supervise? And what we're setting up begs for supervision, doesn't it, right? So we're having to say, oh yeah, all that stuff that I told you before, um, we're going to change it a little bit because they are going to need supervision to make sure they're staying socially distanced and learning the new system of stick and switch if that's what you choose to do. So there is going to be a heavier emphasis on supervising for the first few weeks of class. However, and this is a big however, remember we're still, after they get used to the system, we're still focusing on forward progress for your gymnasts. And in order to have forward progress, you still need to be teaching. So I think we need to call this something else. So it's like some sort of hybrid between, yes, you need to be monitoring social distance and also teaching. It's going to be tricky. In one um, lesson plan, um, so in a circuit, I usually have one spotting station and that's where the coach um, spends most of her time. The rest of the stations are designed to be independent or almost independent. Um, so she spends most of her time teaching on that spotting station and then verbally correcting and challenging the rest of the independent stations. So this time I was like, okay, we're not doing spotting. What else can this look like? 
So I had a handstand station, socially distant. She's working with one kiddo at a time, verbally teaching and showing physically with her own coach body, um, handstands, right? Like donkey kick handstands. And um, to open up the door for coaches can still be teaching after kids have learned what the new system is and they are um, more on the independent end of staying sticking on their station, um, then we can introduce teaching. So it's going to be a fine balance. And I think the transparency piece here is going to be huge. If you're a program director, um, this is going to be important. You, you need to explicitly say, yes, for the first six weeks of this, it's going to be a lot of monitoring and supervising. But after that, we're transitioning back and I expect you to be teaching right? So they are teaching that first six weeks. Absolutely. They're just teaching a new system and it's going to look a lot like supervising. So that's a, it's a huge balance here and a little bit of a pitfall. So just heads up for that. Um, and then their, their coaches are going to need support in verbal teaching, right? So they're going to need, um, some sort of support and professional development around other ways to teach a handstand verbally right? So we can't, so we've taught them for so many years. Here's how you spot. Here's how this leg should look. Here's um, another drill that you can try. Now they need support in. Here's another way to say straight arms. Here's another way to say push through your shoulders or have a brainstorm session with them about what are some other ways you can explain straight strong arms. So that language piece is going to become um, really important here and how you support um, your coaches going forward. Okay, so evolving rigor. This is our last little bit. How will we help coaches keep the stations rigorous without spotting? And this is that skill stacking that I was talking about before. So taking a bunch in your experience, independent skills for that age of the class and um, making sure your coaches know uh, if they can do a forward roll, what else can you add on to keep it rigorous, right? We want to make sure it's that forward progress piece again. What um, forward progress are they making in their skills um, after they have learned the new system? What else can you add to make it more challenging? Or what can you take away to make it um, more challenging or easier for that particular gymnast to execute the skill? Just kidding, it's right here. <laughs> so maintaining that um, uh, increased rigor as your rotation uh, carries on and as the time goes on, how can you make the station that those kiddos are working on harder and more rigorous? So keeping that forward progress piece in mind. Okay, so this is our last little bit. And this is just a, a bunch of stuff that I didn't have a place to put and that I've been thinking about. <laughs> for supporting. All right. Water bottles versus drinking fountains. Um, I saw Patty Comera of um, Patty's All American in Indiana. She took out all of her drinking fountains and put in hand washing stations. Um, it was an investment, but she thought it was worth it and a definitely peace of mind for parents and more access because those bathrooms are um, super concentrated with people. Um, another gym uh, here in Denver uses only water bottles, um, so they don't have drinking fountains at all, so that's something to think about. Perhaps staggering class times, so they, the lobby's not as congested, and um, your coaches have more time to sanitize between classes. Also, revisiting the summer schedule. Look, I think it's, it's worth rethinking. If we're rethinking this, we're rethinking everything, right? Summer summer is not a typical summer this year um kids have been out of school no one's going anywhere a few people are going anywhere um could you have a 9 a.m kindergarten class maybe right there everybody's around so it's something to experiment with it's something to um ask your members for their feedback on of of what could this look like um, and then we brought this up before, can, are you going to continue your virtual classes? Again, those like wildly creative coaches, maybe you have one or two that would head up that um, source of revenue for you. Maybe they like it, 
right? A lot, there's a ton of people who are like, whoo, online virtual class fatigue. Some people are like, no, let's do this thing, right? We still have 30 kids when we, when we do the classes, right? So if you have that sort of demand still, why not keep it as a source of revenue? So something to think about. I think definitely role play with your staff. Role play what the new behavior routine looks like. For sure, role play what the stick and switch or whatever um, new system, your rotating system is going to look like. Um, role play parent talk time, right? So making sure your coaches feel confident and equipped to teach the new way you're going to do preschool is going to be um, really important here. The way you support and think about your coaches is going to shift a little bit, right? The way we've always trained people um, is going to look a little different. And then finally, um, so right now there's a lot of um, fatigue, as I was saying, right? We've, we've been through this woo, 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 up and down, up and down, up and down. It's been a lot. But I want to urge you to keep connecting, keep your connection with your current members because consistency is going to win this game, right? A lot of people came out of the gate and were like, oh, we're going to do all this, this, and look at our virtual stuff. And then it started with like, right? Keep connecting with your members. They do not want to see you go out of business. You don't want to go out of business. And they are ready to come back as long as you keep connecting with them because consistency is going to win this game, right? It's good. The more consistent you are now, the easier the transition back into the gym is going to be. Okay, guys. I know we had some questions. Thank you so much. Um, this is obviously yeah, the first amazing. time I've done this one. Oh, my gosh. Thank you for having me. Um, I hope that was helpful and got people's wheels turning and yes, that's <laughs> absolutely. Hey, we have a couple questions here, so I'll run down the list for you. Okay. okay. So the first one I see popped in the chat box is how do people feel about coloring pages, stickers that tear off individually and newsletters, newsletter handouts? As like an end of class thing, I'm guessing. I'm guessing so. Um, in lieu of stamps. Um, uh, coloring pages, I think are great. Um, newsletters, fine. Great. That's a great way of communicating. Um, also I think followed up by a virtual newsletter just for the paper use and parents need to see the same information in multiple places. Um, so that a virtual newsletter and a paper one, if you are still doing that stickers. Um, I mean, sure. I guess if, if that's going to work for you, I mean, you have to think about how close is the coach getting to put the sticker on um, and how, how diligent we want to be about social distance. So yeah. um, if you cut them out, I think that's, oh, that maybe like cut out stickers. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Cut out stickers. Yes. Only, I mean, they're going to end up all over your lobby, but <laughs> that would be my guess. But um, it's a great alternative to stamps. Try it out. Try it out. I feel like that's the other thing is that we can make a lot of plans, but you, ha you have to try them out and keep that flexibility piece of them right now. Totally. Okay. The next one is what about those gymnasts that need support coming into the gym for separation, anxiety, social distancing is an issue here. What's your opinion? Um, I would say, well, I, um, let me back up and say, um, and I, I got a couple questions before, and I think I want to, this plays into this. Um, one of them said in the States, have they prioritized toddlers and preschool to go back first or the last group? What I'm seeing is that the age is going backward. So start with your, if we're talking just preschoolers, start with your kinders and then phase in your four or fives. Threes are going to be tricky. Parent taught, big question mark there. If we're playing a numbers game, if you can only have a certain amount of people, then it's tricky because you automatically double your people. Um, however, in the same breath, parents are going to be the only ones that are going to stay, going to be able to control, for lack of a better term, guide and shape where a two-year-old is going to go. So parent taught a bit more of a question mark. I would phase in the older kids first and then work down to get all the kinks out of your new system and then phase in those threes and then visit parent tot after that. Um, and now I'm blanking on what this actual question was. <laughs> 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 what 
I, it was about separation anxiety. I like. Oh, separation anxiety. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, listen, I don't think it's any different than what you would have done before. So coach is dropping down eye to eye with kiddo farther apart, but still eye to eye, um, making her feel comfortable. And if she's not ready, she's not ready. This is not a time to push, um, a kiddo into class in, in the before I would have been a little more hardcore about it, but this is not, not a time to do that. So if parent needs to stay, um, close, uh, whether you have a window or they're the only parent allowed in your space, um, it's something to think about. The other thing to think about is if she's having such a hard time transitioning into class, she might not be ready right now. And that's okay too. Remember, we're not for everybody right now. And that's, that's all right. They've been through a lot. Yeah. Uh, does each station require cleaning when switching or just after the session? Yeah, that's a big question. I brought up, I had um, a consultation last week with um, a gym owner when we were talking about the stick and switch system. And she said, do I need a clean in between each kiddo doing each station or at the end of the rotation before another group of children comes. And it's obviously ultimately going to be up to you. What I, what I, my opinion, <laughs> my opinion is between rotations and groups of kids is, is adequate. If you think about a daycare class and the CDC recommendations are keeping the group of kids together, um, it fits under that guideline. I don't know, in my opinion, I don't think it's necessary to clean between each child. For online classes, how long do you recommend? 30 minutes, 45 minutes, and which do you prefer, YouTube or on-demand Zoom? Well, um, I definitely think uh, online classes need to be shorter because Parents would rather have a short, great class than a long, drawn-out class that their kids um, lose interest in. So I would, th I would think 25 minutes to – <laughs> I would do 25 to 30 minutes. And then it depends on your strategy. If it's um, a revenue-generating class, then you need to have, like, a Zoom where you send them the code and they're paying their monthly – tuition or modified mm -hmm. tuition uh, for access to that class or unlimited classes, whatever your approach is. Um, if you want to create free content, then YouTube is fine. Um, I think the biggest difference is between Zoom and YouTube. YouTube is okay, in my opinion, for um, free content because there's no interaction, there's no connection between coach and user. Zoom allows your coaches to actually teach and say, hi, Kim, how are you today? Straight, strong arms in that donkey kick. So it that interaction is where the value is, if that makes sense. So if you're thinking of creating a revenue stream around it, then I would say um, some sort of format where you're able to actually interact with gymnasts. Perfect. Okay. Amber says, what to do when a child hurts themselves? Ah, yeah. Um, that's a great thing. I think at the beginning, I think it's going to be really important to be slightly overstaffed. Like you're going to have to have a floater coach of some kind, or maybe your director, even though she usually teaches a ton of classes, maybe she's hanging back a little bit and um, able to monitor and float around if somebody gets hurt, if somebody needs behavior support, if a parent has a concern. So I think in the beginning, until everyone gets used to this, because remember, you're not only teaching kids, you're teaching their parents too. It's a new system. Um, it's going to be important to have someone accessible to be an extra set of hands. I just think in the beginning, we're going to need that. So that would be my, my best idea there was to have somebody as a support. Skyla would like to know how many children do you suggest on one station at a time? one. So if you have a class of six kids, you're going to have to have six stations, um, six stations yeah. in one rotation and oh, six no, no, no. stations in another um, to accommodate one station per kiddo. So they, each kid has their own station and they work only on that station for 
two-ish, three-ish minutes, depending on how the coach is gauging how things are going and how engaged they are on that work. Um, and then they all switch to the next piece of equipment and they make their way around the circuit. And then Denise asks, how many kids do you recommend in each class? Oh, I think, um, well, I mean, current ratios, I think are okay. And, and again, parent taught big question mark there. So I feel like let's take parent taught out of the equation. For threes, I would do six to one. Maybe even start, I know um, a lot of people are starting, as they phase it in, they're starting with smaller ratios and as they get comfortable with a four to one. And I know gym owners are like, profitability, aha, I hear you. Um, but it's gonna be easier to phase it in slowly than it is starting like right off the bang, like right off the bat with everybody, all full classes all the time. Think, you have to think of this as a phase in like anything else that we're doing. Start it slow, see how it's going, and then scale it to where you were before. So make sure it scales before you scale it. <laughs> um, Cause it, I think it would be, it's tempting to be like, throw open the doors and be like, everybody come. Right, because you're like, I, we miss those like chubby toes on the beam and all these things. But <clears throat> starting off slowly, I think, is the better bet. So even if your ratio for threes is six to one, maybe your fours is seven, eight ish to one. Um, maybe you started off at four and five, something like that. So it's again like something to rethink of how this is going to phase in. Okay, and then last one, how do you clean wooden bars? Any ideas for that? Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, that was, I forgot to bring that up. When I was lesson planning, I stayed away from bars somewhat. So instead of having like, a lot of people have like three, the three or four sets of bars in a row, um, I use rings a lot because they're easily, like you can sanitize them super easily. Um, chalk on a bar, I don't know. I'm not a great expert in that. That would be something to ask a, a gym owner is not my area of expertise. Um, I also threw a mat over one of the bars. So don't be afraid to think on your bar rotation to add in other pieces of equipment. So I'm a big fan of that anyway. Every rotation should hit every piece of equipment, vault bars, beam floor. Um, so drag in a beam, drag in, like if they're doing, maybe you do like a floor bar and a, a station on a floor bar, which is, doesn't have a lot of chalk on it most times, um, that you can wipe off a little easier. So when we're rethinking things, rethink how you can still get grip strength and bars and hanging without a bar without as many bars as usual. Sarah, I'm gonna add in really quick. I actually just entered the wrong link into the chat, but Truce is a great cleaning product that awesome. is, um, I actually met the owner at a weightlifting meet, but they are great with cleaning chalk safely off of uh, beams and bars and items in your gym. It's all natural. It doesn't have a lot of super harsh chemicals in it. But the best thing that I found in terms of cleaning bars is that, you know, after you use something like Truce and you have to take your wire brush and you're going to have to scrub a little bit on your bars, you have to build that chalk back up. So the main thing with cleaning bars is mainly just the time that it takes to build the chalk back up on your bars for the kids before you're putting them back on there safely. So for me, cleaning wooden bars is more about the safety of putting the kids back on the bars after you've scrubbed all of the chalk off. <laughs> but if you're looking for a product, I actually do recommend Truce. Um, is it T-R-U-C-E? Yes, but that's not the right website that I just popped in the chat. I just, I thought better of it and double checked it, but the name is correct. The okay. name is correct. Yeah. And then last, um, if you have any more questions, let's, we're going to wrap this up soon, but go ahead and pop something in there for Sarah. I see um, a lot of parents are concerned with bubbles in the gym. Crossing over, any suggestions on a replacement for bubbles? Uh, like we're talking actual blowing bubbles, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, you know, what about parachute? That's, uh, I, but the, the gym I shot in this weekend had a massive parachute. 
and they were wildly six feet apart. Each kid has a color. And then at the end, you wipe down the handles, but they're wipeable. So that's great. So you could do parachute. Um, music, utilizing music more, I think uh, will be handy because they can still dance if you give them like a visual, like a taped square or a chalk circle, whatever you want it to be. We stay in our circle and we dance and follow directions and um, let loose a little bit. Um, I think there's a ton of um, other things that you can do other, other than bubbles. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, Sarah, um, let me say that Sarah's company, Happy Gymnastics, um, makes amazing products for preschool programs. So I actually found her because I used Happy Gymnastics as a part of my staff training. It was in my onboarding process for my gym. So when I hired new um, entry level employees, they were all required to go through certain modules from Happy Gymnastics. So that's my connection with Sarah. So I would highly recommend that you all go check out Happy Gymnastics because um, she just produces amazing content as you can see. So Sarah, Hi. I'll let you tell everybody where they can find you. Oh yeah, just happygymnastics.com. And then um, on the Facebook page during, at the beginning of this pandemic, I started Tiny Training Tuesday on Happy Gymnastics Facebook page. So every Tuesday there's like a five to seven minute little training um, on, on, uh, on a Facebook Live. So you can check that out too. Amazing, yes, okay. So any follow-up questions, please go ahead and post in the Love Gymnastics Facebook group. We will make sure that we get some PDFs from today's presentation posted in there for you. And yeah, thanks so much, Sarah. We'll go ahead and sign off. Awesome, thanks for having me, you guys. You can do this, it's gonna be awesome. I can't wait to see what this is gonna look like in your space, so thank you for being here. Perfect. Thanks, Kim. <laughs> Bye, Sarah. Bye, everybody. Bye. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>